All right, let's do this. Uh, you've got a whole bunch of questions for me, and I'm ready to answer them. So uh, last Friday, my question triangle was filled to the brim with amazing questions. And uh, as I have said, I will try to answer anything you give me. Here goes. Uh, I'm just going to go through them one at a time and try to answer them as well as I can. So uh, they're a bit uh, wide variety this time. Uh, sort of all over the place and sciencey questions, so uh, they're not going to be entirely related to each other, but I'm sure we can uh, enjoy the, the 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 journey we take. Here we go. So without further ado, question one. Question one is: If corn oil is made from corn and olive oil comes from olives, where does baby oil come from? Where does baby oil come from? A great question. A great, uh, it's just, uh, I'm, I'm just so happy that someone asked this because I think it's pretty clear to all of us where it comes from. It comes from babies. Of course it does. Baby oil comes from babies. But the question really is, is exactly uh, how does the baby oil get extracted from the baby? So um, this might uh, bring up something that you might remember from our uh, biology unit. Uh, when we were talking about embryos and whatnot, I mentioned at some point that all the babies, when they're born, have that uh, wonderful soft spot on their head. Now, this becomes incredibly useful at this point. So um, this is going to lead on to what I'm talking about because really what we're talking about is the same process by which we extract uh, maple syrup from trees. Uh, so so what we do is we, we, we have the baby. We have the baby. And there's a time period uh, after it's born known as the syruping stage. Now, this is between the ages of one to three months. Uh, this is when you still have the soft spot on the head. And uh, parents must take it down to the syruping uh, stations, And uh, in which case uh, we make use of what's known as a, a device here. The same, actually the exact same uh, thing that's used to take out the maple syrup. It's also known as a spile in case, in case you want to look that up. Uh, and then at that point, then what we need to do is we need to uh, simply, uh, it's a pretty simple process actually. The spile is uh, gently uh, inserted into the baby's head and the baby is then uh, suspended over a bucket for a certain amount of time, at which point then we have uh, plenty of time to extract the baby oil. And, and that's all there is to it. It's pretty simple. All you need is... Uh, little bit of patience and time and some gentle squeezing and what with the current uh, birth rates in our country uh, guaranteed uh, a nice constant healthy supply for all our uh, baby oil needs uh, in case you're curious and want to get a little more information on this uh, I highly recommend that you check out this website here uh, please go to it this, uh, and uh, see what else you can learn about uh, baby oil moving on Question two. Question two. What is question two? Uh, a student asked, how can fish hold their breath for so long underwater? It's a really good question. I mean, how do they do it? How do they do it? Now, this is actually kind of an interesting uh, question here. It's something you might not know about fish. Uh, how do they do it? Well, let's just take a look. Here we have a fish. And you always notice that when we draw fish, uh, we draw little bubbles coming out of their mouth. Where are these bubbles coming from? And I think the, the important thing is to understand what it's like inside of a fish. So here I'm going to just draw very quickly uh, the interior of a fish. This is a cutaway view. And as you can see uh, when we're looking at this, we have pretty much an uh, empty body. Uh, it is filled with the, the sea, the water, as it breathes it in. And the only skeletal uh, parts of the fish are its skull alone. The skull is really the only part there. Uh, you can see it's attached to the outer uh, skin of the fish. Uh, so this is where it has its teeth and everything. But the, the rest of the bones in the fish are actually non-existent. Uh, fish don't have bones. Uh, they're added in later for effect. Uh, it's one of those things that people get creeped out. Uh, they don't like having their food without bones, and so it's added artificially afterwards when you're at the market. But what you notice uh, in the inside is that the interior of the skin does have these large protrusions on the top and bottom of the fish. And the reasons for these is because the actual uh, thing that's going on inside a fish is that it is 
actually a very tiny buildup of electric charge. And we've, we've already done electric charge before, so here I want to talk about that. Is that what happens is that the ends here start to build up a large amount of either negative or positive charges, which in really does actually result in a large electrical discharge between the two. At a certain point, there's little zaps, sort of like a little bit of lightning inside of the fish's body, uh, right through all that water that the fish has uh, sucked in every time it's swimming. Now, why is that important? Well, in order to explain that, we have to look and say, well, what exactly is going on? The water itself is made up of a molecule, and we've done molecules. Molecule is where we have oxygen and two hydrogens. That is water, H2O. So when we have the electricity uh, flying through this molecule, what happens is that the bonds will actually break breaking apart the H2O into its separate hydrogen and oxygen components. And fish, the fish's body actually makes use of this by breathing out the hydrogen, which is in the form of the bubbles that we all see, and that's the hydrogen gas escaping the fish. And then the parts of the oxygen atom are then uh, sort of taken in by the fish's body for its uh, energy needs. And so... That's always kind of interesting. We always think, well, why can't a fish breathe? Well, it does. It actually breathes inside its own body. It creates its own oxygen. Isn't that fascinating? You wouldn't have thought that. You really wouldn't have thought that. But, well, there you go. We learn something new every day. And if you want to learn more about the way fish uh, do this, uh, I highly suggest you check out both uh, this YouTube site. Please check it out. And at the same time, be sure to check out this one as well, another really fascinating exploration into the world of uh, the electricity inside of a, a fish's body and how it breaks down the water molecules for its own uh, respiration. Amazing. Question three. Question three. Why did ancient people bury so many buildings? Why did they do that? Let's explore this. So as you know that when we go to your average archaeological dig into an ancient civilization, they're generally digging down into the earth, big deep holes, and finally after a bit of digging, we're going to come up to finding ourselves an ancient civilization underneath all that dirt. But why is it under there? Well, clearly they, they buried their entire civilization under the dirt. But why would anyone in ancient times do this? Now, there is an answer. Of course there's an answer. And it has a lot to do with uh, something that is common to all ancient civilizations. In fact, it's something that we should be aware of ourselves if we want to be a little careful about what the future may hold for us. What I'm referring to here is something known as the internment response to the idiocy crisis cycle of an epoch. Uh, you, you don't usually see this. Uh, archaeologists tend to use uh, a different acronym for this. They call it the T-I-R-T-T-I-C-C-O-A-E solution. Just a shorter way of saying the internment response to the idiocy crisis cycle of an epoch. And it's basically uh, a logical response to a uh, civilization that begins to find itself at a certain crisis point. And I want to kind of lead you along here about what I'm talking about. So this has happened to uh, pretty much almost every civilization before us. Uh, a little bit of a history lesson for you, really, is what I'm trying to break down here. But there is science to it. So what happens is that uh, a civilization uh, begins to find as they progress that they start to... Uh, basically do some really nutty things such as pollute the atmosphere and uh, produce a ton of uh, refuse in the oceans and pollute it. It just is a natural recourse of any kind of a progress of civilization and uh, enormous amounts of pollution and, 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 and also a, a large increase of violence in that society. And, and what happens is that all this going on, uh, many people become incredibly frustrated with their own civilization. And, and it seems to be that almost every civilization excuse me, comes up 
with the same solution. And this is that the, the best thing for, for humans to do is to, well, not have use of their limbs. Uh, clearly, uh, them using their limbs is producing all sorts of bad things. So what they end up doing, and it's fascinating that everybody comes up with the same, same solution. But hey, history is history. They all will end up burying themselves um, into the sand uh, with only their heads sticking out. Now, you might think this is an extreme reaction, but let's face it. Uh, what else are you going to do when everyone's just simply uh, ruining everything? You got to do something. And uh, okay, honestly, w let's think about what would happen at this point. Clearly, uh, some people are fairly unhappy about the situation. For example, hey, I'm buried into the dirt, uh, only my head sticking out. I, I got nothing to do now. So, so what they do is they they always come up with the same solution here. It is the burying of all their stuff because if you're underground, well, you might as well have all your stuff there. So everything, uh, your your homes, your sinks, your your, your toilets, your your beds, everything that you have and use every day, uh, is buried down there with you, and therefore enabling you to have your day to day activities without any kind of fuss or muss, and therefore everybody's happy happily buried up to their necks uh, in the sand. Um, so if you want to hear more about that, um, I've got a few websites for you. Of course, uh, here's a, a one site I highly suggest you go to all about archaeological ruins and how people have uh, buried themselves like that. It's unfortunate we never did really much uh, science of archaeology in our class. I mean, we're limited by time, uh, but hopefully this is going to get you kind of excited about uh, this this burgeoning, uh, fascinating uh, discipline out there and, and may lead to more questions uh, that you can uh, pursue. Question, question four. Question four, a student asked me, if sound can't travel through vacuums, why are they so loud? That, 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 that's a good question. And uh, this one actually has a fairly simple uh, answer, and I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly. So, so let's just let's just shoot down uh, the entire logic of the entire thing. So, what we got is that we we know that uh, uh, vacuum in space kills sound. Uh, sound is uh, ripped apart by vacuums, and so uh, sound has a natural kind of fear of uh, of vacuums. And so, when you have a, a vacuum in your home. Uh, the sounds will, of course, uh, run away, uh, run away from the vacuum uh, out of fear. Uh, and as a result, uh, we'll end up going all into your ear to hide from the vacuum. It's that simple. I, I didn't really need to say much about that one. I, I think it's fairly obvious to us. And of course, obviously, with all the sounds in your ear, it's, it's going to be a little loud. It's going to be a little loud. So it's really just simply the fleeing of the vacuum. Uh, that's That's... If you're interested in a little bit more about uh, vacuums and sound, uh, check this out. Check this site out. I think you'll like it. Um, in fact, I've got two for you. Here's another site that you might want to check out that I think you'll find really, really interesting. Uh, yep, that's all i got to say about that. Sound and vacuum. Pretty simple. Question five. What do we got? Why do meteors always land in craters that's a you know what I, I that was something that i had to actually look up i, I was i was just thrown over by that I, I was just bowled over by by this really just very insightful question and and it's true why why do they do it why do they always land but it turns out you know what there's a little bit of math involved so let's go into it so here we have a uh planet in this case a, a planetoid because this is the moon and and what you're going to notice is a common feature of all planets and and, and you know if you you look at it and you're going to notice that it is covered in what's known as whoops planetary acne this is what we call the crater systems uh grows on most planets uh, enormous amounts of planetary acne um no fault of its own. It's just something that it, uh, you know, when, when, when uh, planets get bigger, you know, they kind of grow out of it. But at this stage, uh, they have a lot of it. And so what you might notice when you look at this, though, it's covered in it. It's covered in it. So what you want to 
what, what comes kind of obvious is that how could it not hit a crater? I mean, look how many there are. What are the odds that a meteor would even miss a crater with that many on the surface? In fact, uh, there's some uh, very famous uh, mathematical equations related to this. Uh, I'll, I'll just pop it up right here. The, the percentage of meteor into crater impacts uh, right here for you. Uh, the summation of I from 2 to 10 of N minus 1 multiplied by the factorial of 2 plus the limit as N approaches infinity of uh, 9 plus 1 over N plus uh, the complex number I squared. Now, this actually leads to a pretty high number uh, and so the, the, the odds, the probabilities of you having uh, a meteor miss a crater is almost nil. It's almost nil. And, and the, math just, the math just shows you. It's not even up for argument. This is just clear that uh, there's, there's no other way it can happen. So it's, you wouldn't have thought that. You wouldn't have thought that. But as it turns out, yeah, uh, it, it's more about how easy it for, for it to miss. No, no, no chance at all. Looking for more information on uh, meteor impacts? Check this out. Check this site out. I think you'll enjoy reading about it. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting to you. All about uh, meteor impacts on, on planets, specifically on the Earth. Moving right along. Question six. Question six. How can we trust atoms if they can make up everything? So... So I'm feeling, I'm feeling the student who gave this question is, uh, I'm thinking maybe it's a joke. Maybe. Maybe this is a joke. But I would like to go uber nerd on this, totally science geek out on this thing, and actually answer this question for real, for real. How can we trust atoms if they can make up everything? And, and the truth of the matter is, uh, they don't, they don't make up everything. I want to show you a little thing here. This is all the matter in the universe. And I want to sh take a look at that. This is how much uh, of the universe is made up of atoms. Not even 5% of the universe is actually made up of atoms. For the most part, we have unknown, unknown matter. One is uh, known as dark matter and the other one is known as dark energy that makes up almost all of the, the matter in the universe. Uh, atoms is basically everything that we see and experience, uh, but dark matter and dark energy actually makes up the bulk of everything. The question you might ask yourself is exactly what is dark matter and dark energy? Dark matter is uh, something that apparently doesn't have any kind of effect on anything except it does have gravitational effects the reason why we know there's dark matter in the universe is because uh light bends now the reason maybe i need to show a little something here okay so let's say that uh this is the uh the earth and uh, i'm looking at uh a galaxy over here but there's a there's an even larger galaxy or, or another galaxy over here now normally the light coming from this galaxy would kind of go in straight lines because we know that light moves away in straight lines like so but what we also know about light is that is it it is affected by gravity but it has to be quite a bit of gravity it has to be quite a bit but a galaxy definitely would uh, would suffice. So what happens is that I'm going to draw the real thing that happens here is that the light will come along, oops, not drawing over, and bend, and then before you know it, we actually see, and and what happened on the other side too. I might as well show it there. We and this is known as gravitational lensing. So gravity actually bends light, and therefore, as far as you are concerned, when you look at it, you think that the galaxy is over here. Well, actually, I guess just as far away, right? You would see it over here. Well, actually, you would see it over here and over here. You would actually see kind of a ring of the galaxy around 
It's almost like making a, a circle around that. Uh, what does this look like? So take a look at this uh, photograph. This was actually taken by the Hubble telescope. You see a very, very big galaxy here. By the way, all these things, these are not stars. These are all galaxies. This is being looked at by the Hubble telescope incredibly far away. So remember, each of these galaxies have billions upon billions of stars. So enormous amounts of gravity. So what's happening here is that you're looking at the bending of light around this galaxy on all sides. There must be a galaxy on the other side farther away than the galaxy we see here. And the image of it is coming out as a circle, kind of a circular smear of the galaxy all around. This was predicted by Einstein. It wasn't alive to see this happen, wasn't alive to see it. It was one of the many things that he predicted that later on people proved. Uh, this is amazing. This is amazing that we can see this. Now, what's interesting about this is what does this have to do with the whole business of dark matter? Well, as it turns out, this bending that we see, let me go back to my other picture here, this bending here can be predicted by how much matter would bend it. Like I, the amount of matter can be uh, calculated, in other words, by what we see from the galaxies. We can uh, more or less make an estimation of how large we know the galaxy to be, which means we know how much the light should bend because it gives you an estimate of how much gravitational force it should have. And it turns out that the light is bending way more than it should. An enormous amount, which means there is something else doing it besides the matter itself that's giving us this amazing picture. In other words, there's other matter in this galaxy that is causing the bending, and we don't know what it is because it's not made of atoms. It's not made of the normal matter we're used to, and right now, we don't know what it is. That's for your generation to figure out. Uh, it's basically right now is just called dark matter. Not because it's dark. Dark is sort of a term we're using because we don't have a clue what it is. That's what dark matter is. Now you might notice that there was another thing there listed. Dark energy. In fact, dark matter is only 25% of the universe. What's all this dark energy? Uh, I'm not going to get into it too much. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fairly long, uh, fairly long explanation. And it, it talks about why we uh, why the universe is not just expanding right now, but it's not even slowing down. It's accelerating. And so there's a lot of ideas about what is doing that. But the the stuff that we think is causing the expansion of the universe is what we call dark energy. So kind of neat. If you want to learn more about this kind of stuff, highly suggest you first go here and check out uh, a few things said on this uh, space.com, a really great site uh, for all things cosmology. And here's sort of a rundown of things such as dark matter and dark energy. If you want a little more information, check it out there. Uh, last question. Question seven. Uh, why are you so angular? Why? What? 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 Why are you so? Why are you so angular? Why are what? Why are you? Um. Okay, I. I don't get it. 